Hi, welcome to yet another YouTube video game review. This video is going to be the first one of a multiple part series of retrospectives about what I consider the quintessential era for the Need for Speed series of racing games. With that being said, this is Need for Speed Underground, a retrospective. First things first, this is going to need a bit of context. The year is 2002, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2 just came out on the PC, Xbox, GameCube, and PS2. Hot Pursuit 2 was the first Need for Speed game released on the 6th generation of consoles, unless you count the GPA port of Porsche 2000, and the last game in the series worked on by EA Seattle, at least on most platforms. That's because on the PS2, Hot Pursuit 2 was an entirely different game. This version was made by Black Box Games, and while the other versions received mixed reception, this one was widely praised by critics. Better graphics, better physics, and the ability to choose a female driver which didn't come back until, like, Shift 2, and then disappeared again until the newest ones. Because of their success with Hot Pursuit 2, EA then tasked the newly renamed EA Black Box with the creation of the next mainline game of the series, which became Need for Speed Underground and came out in 2003 on the 6th generation consoles and PC, plus a GBA port made by Pocketeers, which was actually a really interesting port featuring 3D graphics on the GBA. Underground broke away from the series conventions. Instead of having the player drive European exotics and prototypes around self-contained tracks, Underground capitalized on the import tuner street racing culture, popularized by the Fast and the Furious a couple of years earlier, and already capitalized on by games like Angel Studios, now Rockstar San Diego's Midnight Club, which interestingly enough came out before the Fast and the Furious. Now, with all that exposition over, let's start with the game itself. Underground takes place in Olympic City, a mishmash of various cities across the US, ostensibly located in Texas if that one billboard is to be believed, and while it doesn't feature an open world, which is probably the main sore point for this game, all of the tracks in the game are on the same map, and the game just switches collision data when a track is selected. Pretty smart, but I have to wonder why the developers didn't just add in a free roam mode where the whole map is opened up. I guess because the map is still pretty small. Underground was one of my favorite games as a kid, and I still replay it from time to time. In fact, I haven't actually uh, finished it until last year. The game starts with the classic EA Games intro, the still exceedingly cool THX deep note intro, and then a trailer shot of some cars zooming by the shot I actually used at the beginning of this video. After this, you get one of the trademarks of this era of Need for Speed games, a PSA about safe driving. The first time around, it's Mark DeVellis, former race car driver and currently executive producer for various EA Sports games, mainly UFC. This is gonna change soon enough in the next games, but for now, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. After this, you get a really cool intro of Melissa, a character we're gonna be talking about a bit later in the video, racing through the city in her Nissan Eclipse, which gets tuned as she drives it. I've always loved this intro as a kid, and it actually led me to believe that the protagonist of the game was the mysterious woman in the intro. After she jumps the lift bridge, the intro ends and we finally get to the menu. After you make a profile, you're given a few options. First is underground mode, which is the main story mode of the game. While well, calling it a story mode is a bit uh, generous. The whole story of the game is told through like a handful of cutscenes and some flavored text from the various characters you race throughout the game. After the first race in a tuned up car, you wake up. Is that your fantasy? Turns out, it was all a dream. Bonus points for subverting the cliche, I guess, since this happens at the beginning of the story, and a nice taste of what's to come. This also became one of the staples of the series, as we'll see in future videos. The, uh, the, the fast car, not the dream cliché. Although we'll get plenty more other clichés. Anyway, you wake up and meet Samantha, who is pretty cool. I liked her. She's not exactly three-dimensional, except for the fact that she's literally a 3D model. But for how bare-bones the story is, it works. Samantha laughs in your face as you wake up and calls you a loser. 
and then gives you a quick explanation of the street racing scene in Olympic City. Basically, this guy named Eddie is a winner, and winners get mad respect. And if I understand the cutscene correctly, basically your motivation in the story is to win races and win over Eddie's girlfriend Melissa. The cool girl from the intro. You advance in the story mode by replying to texts from strangers What's up, bro? and then beating said strangers in races. You get to know the strangers through flavor texts and a bit of voice acting, and they give you increasingly better races to win. As you climb the rankings for every race mode, you end up racing against Eddie's crew, the Eastsiders, Todd, Kurt, and Chad, multiple times. I'm not sure if they upgrade their cars alongside yours, but I do know that they switch their cars towards the end of the game. It's probably just me being weird, but I get a strange feeling of satisfaction knowing that they had to buy new cars just to beat me, and then proceed to lose. Throughout the story mode, you also occasionally get challenged to time trials by Samantha to win unique visual parts, or by TJ, a mechanic who legit used to scare me as a kid, who gives you unique performance parts. At the same time, you have to keep buying upgrades for your car, and you can buy new cars too. Oddly enough, in the first underground, you can't actually have more than one car at a time. If you want to get a new one, you'll have to trade in your current car. Thankfully, you keep all of your parts, but it can get annoying, especially since you usually have to pay a trade-in price when you switch. After you put enough pressure on Eddie by beating the crap out of his crew, he tells you that he'll only race you if you beat Samantha in a race, which you do. And then TJ takes her car because he's a jerk. You race him too, and you win Samantha's car back for her. After you beat Eddie, a mysterious racer turns up in a silver 350Z and challenges you to another race. She turns out to be Melissa, which is a twist I really enjoyed. Her jerk boyfriend wasn't the best racer in town after all. It was the cool hot girl who I pretended was the lesbian all along. Y yeah, I, I did that. So, with a story out of the way, how does the game feel to play? Well, the physics are solid, the cars feel great to drive, and the boost you get from using the nitros is better than I'd remembered. I hadn't really noticed a difference in the way cars handle between the various Need for Speed games of the era, but after having played through all of them for the series, I can say that the Underground 1 and 2 physics are my personal favorites. Cars feel light, and they corner really well, which is great for, you know, street racing. Underground has a handful of race types, and they all feel great. You have your basic circuits and sprints, which are just, you know, regular races. And you also get a lap knockout mode, which is a circuit except whoever is in last place when the lap ends gets knocked out. The only complaint I have here is that the map is quite small, and towards the end of the game, the races start repeating a lot. The more interesting game modes are drift and drag, though. Drift is, well, drifting. You slide around on what I assume is an oiled track in either a parking lot or a commercial port and try to get as many points as you can. You get a multiplier for getting past a certain score in a single drift, and you lose it if you go too slow, take too long between drifts, or bump into a wall. Bumping into walls will also cancel out whatever drift you are doing at the moment, so try not to do that after just having gotten an insane drift at the maximum multiplier. Drag, on the other hand, is kind of the total opposite. You race in a mostly straight line while avoiding cars, construction sites, and whatever else the city throws at you. Including trains. Especially trains. You can jump over trains, it's cool. Also, you're forced into using a manual transmission, and while everywhere else in the game it's alright to redline your engine, here it's not. If you do that, the engine blows and you lose. If you crash into stuff, you also lose. It would be pretty interesting if the whole game worked like this, but I can see why it doesn't. As a tangent, when I played this game as a kid, I always felt bad for crashing into traffic cars because they just stopped dead in their tracks, and I'd assumed I killed those people. Now, speaking of tangents and breaking laws, apparently this game was originally going to feature cops, or at least that's what it looks like by looking at the code. Of course, that could just be a leftover from Hot Pursuit 2, which is built on the same engine.
If you want to learn more about this game's development, I can't recommend Grand Theft Aero's video about it enough, which I'll link in the description. The AI in this game isn't exactly great, and there are certain spots on the map where it will crash, so it being a racing game and also 2003, the devs added in rubber banding. This is supposed to make sure the AI can keep up with the player, but it can also lead to painfully difficult races towards the end of the game. What particularly comes to mind is Enduro Street Circuit, a 7 lap circuit race against 3 opponents. If you get this far, prepare to have to drive perfectly, cause otherwise you will lose. Yeah, even if you have the same cars as the other racers, if you as much as scratch your paint, at least one of them will descend upon your mortal soul with the power of a thousand suns from behind, and put an end to your mortal coil. This race in particular is so hard that when I was stuck on it and looked it up online, people were saying that you either have to drive perfectly or downgrade your car to trick the AI into going slower. Cause yeah, the AI's cars are directly proportional to yours. This isn't the only offending race, cause this game is brutal towards the end. But it's the worst of the bunch by far. After you finish this, the rest of the game will seem extremely easy, and you'll breeze through literally every other race, including Eddie and Melissa. This kind of makes the game's ending anticlimactic, and everything past this race ends up feeling like a victory lap, despite it not even being like the second to last race or anything. Now, of course, you can't have a Need for Speed game without the cars. Again, a huge departure from previous games in the series, Underground focuses on tuners. Everything from your mom's Honda Civic to your dad's midlife crisis, to drift legends like the Nissan 240SX or the Mazda RX-7, and newer sports cars like the Nissan 350Z or Skyline GTR. That's not to say that all the cars in the game are Japanese imports though. Besides those cars, a handful of European and American cars managed to make their way in. The Dodge Neon, Ford Focus, and oddly enough a EU spec Volkswagen Golf, and a Peugeot 206 which wasn't even sold in North America. Another interesting thing is that, thanks to the expansive customization options, you can beat the game with the first car you pick. Seriously, try it, it's, it's not even that hard. And with that segue, we get into the customization. After all, you can have street racing and tuners without the tuning. Or I guess you can, but that's not the point. While upgrading your car was introduced years earlier in high stakes, this game is the first one in the series to introduce proper customization. You don't only get to choose which performance parts you get into your car, plus a choice of brands, because of course that would be in this is EA we're talking about, but you also get to visually modify your car. You will build your own ricer and you will love it. And yeah, you will build your own ricer because the game forces you to in order to progress. Thankfully, unlike its sequel, which we'll talk about in the next video, the game doesn't force you to go completely over the top, so the end product is probably gonna be something you're gonna like. Because if you're not into this kind of stuff, why would you even play this game, am I right? Speaking of which, on the visual side, Underground lets you select stuff like bumpers, spoilers, rims, but also put stuff like neons or vinyls on your car. You unlock parts by playing the story, and then you buy them. Oddly enough, you have to buy them first if you want to use them in Quick Race, which as far as I know, has been dropped in all subsequent games. Another weird thing about visual customization in this game is that towards the end you get a choice between two different wide body kit styles. These are mutually exclusive. This never happens. Other than this, I think it's worth mentioning the Nitrous upgrade. It's the one performance upgrade that actually changes the gameplay once you install it. Nitrous basically unlocks a new button on your controller, which gives you an instant boost of speed and acceleration. Like all other performance upgrades, Nitrous has a couple of tiers, getting better with each upgrade. Nitrous also gives the game an element of strategy, as you only get one tank per race, and you have to be careful on how you use it. Use it too early and you'll get smoked if you make a mistake later on in the race. Use it too late and well it's gonna be too late and you'll have already been smoked by then. Thankfully you can use it in bursts, so you'll have to use it sparingly throughout the races. Now the graphics. 
Underground looks great for a game made in 2003. I'm still amazed that it holds up so well 17 years later, especially the reflections. There's something about those reflective roads and the art direction in general that makes me love the way this game looks. Since I'm using the PC version with the high resolution patch, Underground looks greater than ever, and with the HD Reflections patch it looks even better, but I removed that one for the sake of this video, since I wanted to keep it as vanilla as possible without sacrificing screen real estate. Olympic City is full of cool looking buildings, grungy shortcuts, and bright lights zooming past you at every turn. I hadn't realized this until very recently, but the Underground games have a certain stylized look to them that I haven't really seen in other racing games, at least not in racing games that aren't set in the future with like flying cars and stuff. Or I guess probably Blur, but I don't think I've ever played that game. Tons of neon, sidewalks lined with what looks like fairy lights just hanging off of poles, and even the neon barriers that keep you from going off the track. One thing I didn't particularly like was the use of flag girls at the beginning of every race. Thankfully, the other female characters aren't as sexualized as they tend to get in later games in the series. I know it's kind of a street racing thing in 2003, but like, they could have just not. The music in this game is extremely 2003, and while I used to think that I prefer the music in some of the sequels, after replaying all of the Underground Era games, which gave me the idea for the series, I kind of realized that I probably like this game's music the most. You get rock, rap, and electronic music, and unfortunately I can't play any of it in this video because it's all licensed. So yeah, this is Need for Speed Underground. It ushered in a new era in the Need for Speed series, and it's probably one of the best arcade racing games ever made. There isn't much that Underground didn't get right, it had the graphics, it had the music, and most importantly, it got the gameplay right. Started a formula that Blackbox would use for the next few years, and while looking back I didn't think I liked this game as much as I do, well, I do. I'd always skip it in order to play Underground 2, or Most Wanted, and, well, spoilers. Mm, no, not that kind. But yeah, overall, Underground is a great racing game, and kind of a portal back into the early 2000s. If you haven't played it, I can't recommend it enough, especially the PC version with 13 AG's widescreen patch and a controller. If you enjoyed this video and if you liked the Need for Speed series, stay tuned for the next few videos. I'm gonna make one of these for every game up until Carbon, which is like, what, three more videos? With that being said, see you in Underground 2. But before I go, I'd like to give special thanks to Grand Theft Arrow for helping me find the pre-release build he showcased in one of his videos, Torque98 for linking me to the debug camera mode, and of course, Xanavir for making that mod in the first place.